Hey, welcome to the channel. Thank you for logging in today. It's epic that I get to speak to you all each week through this platform. It's really amazing. And I've got something very exciting for you guys today. And before I get into that, the regulars on this channel know that I love getting to know you people. So please do leave a comment below and let me know how are you doing? Where are you from? What are some of the things that you've been experimenting with this week? And uh, how's that going for you so far? I'd love to learn from you guys too. So anyway, diving into today's topic, I would like to call this a mix prep ritual. This is my mix prep ritual, meaning when I get multi-track files from a client and they've asked me to mix a song for them, there are certain things that I do in order to set myself up for a successful or a productive mixing session. What do we mean by that? When I'm in my creative zone, I don't want to be distracted by the very many things that, that I should have ideally taken care of even before I started mixing the song. And trust me, all the big engineers the biggest of the big engineers have assistants doing this exactly for them. But you and I don't really have assistants. So how can we try and simulate that process for ourselves? How can we how can we do that? We can definitely do it. So here's my tip. Don't do it on the day that you plan to mix the song because you're going to get into ear fatigue and you're going to lose that zone. So try and do this a couple of days before or at least a day before. And the next day when you walk into the studio, all you're going to be doing is you walk in with a mindset to mix the song. You sit there with that creative zone of yours, shut all the distraction and start mixing your track. So let's dive in. Grab your favorite snack because this one's going to be a bit long and uh, watch me while I do my thing and let me know what you think about it. Step number one, we are going to create a brand new empty session so that we can import the tracks and start work on it. And uh, let's name the session. The song is called Take It Back by this terrific sounding punk rock band called Burst and Bloom. Check it out. It's really good. And make sure that the sample rate that you're creating this session uh, is the same sample rate as the original recording so that you don't have to convert the files. And uh, the original recording was in 48, so I'm going to keep it at 48. And there you go. So this is an empty Pro Tools session. Now remember, although I'm using Pro Tools, you can do everything that I'm talking about or showing here in any other door of your choice, whether you're using Logic or Ableton or uh, uh, Studio One or Cubase or whatever door you're using, uh, you can do all of this in your door as well. So let's import the tracks now and we're gonna go into File, Import Audio. There you go. All my files are here. Select the tracks. I want to copy all of this into my audio folder because uh, when I'm transferring the session, when I'm done mixing it, and if I want to give the session back to the band or the client, or if I want to send this to somebody else to do something, then you don't have to worry about finding all the audio files and dragging it into the folder and relinking everything. So this allows you to make sure that you can transfer the session copy it onto any hard disk or send it through a file transfer system and they can open the session and everything's going to be exactly in place. All right. Uh, okay, now that we have all of the tracks here, let's remove the tracks that you don't need. I don't need the click. Hang on. Before I do that, let me first set the tempo 155 because the project... Uh, the client said mention the tempo when they sent the file. It's 155. It's mentioned in the folder and I'm making sure that it's set to that. Just in case I want to make any edits, then it's very much on grid. The next thing that I'd like to do is I want to arrange the session. As you can see, the tracks are not organized. They're not exactly in the, the way that I would like it to be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start arranging the tracks and put it in a way that works for me. Okay. So the first thing that I want to get to is the drums, because when I start mixing a song, drums is the first instrument that I that I start working on. So I can either drag the tracks from here and move them however I want, but uh, in order to make it more easier, I can actually do this on this track pane towards the left side of my screen. So we're going to take our kick track here, move it on top. Then I'm going to add my snare. If there are multiple kicks, move all the multiple kicks together. I don't see multiple kick tracks. I only see one kick track in this session. And uh, where's my snare? Yeah, there you go. There's your snare top. And then we have a snare bottom. Then I want my 
hi hats. So kick snare hats is the first three tracks that I go for, and then I go for my tom one and two and floor tom. I don't see a floor tom here either. Looks like they only used one rack tom and one floor tom. No problem. So we put it right after our hi hats, and then we go for overheads and oops. Then we go for our room tracks. And then we add um, the hall track. I'm assuming that's the drum hall. It can't be anything else. So I'm going to put that there. And then I want to start treating my bass tracks because that's what I like. So there's a bass DI and then there's a bass rat. Rat is a distortion pedal. If you don't know, the guitar players use, uh, they've tracked the bass through that for a more gritty distorted bass tone. That's pretty cool. And some of these tracks are named as BG high, BG low. I'm assuming they, it either means backing guitar parts or it's background vocals. It could be one of those, but I'm assume I'm going to assume that it's vocals. Uh, we could quickly take a look at the regions here. Uh, there you go. This looks more like vocals to me, not exactly guitars. Uh, so we're going to drag them down because vocals are not something that I deal with in the beginning. I do it very much at the end. And harms, some form of a harmony, I guess. So we're going to do that later. Uh, guitar tracks. There are our guitar tracks. There's our roads. We're going to drag all the the organ, the piano, and the roads together because they're more keyboard-based instruments, or you know, so a keyboard-like, keyboard-esque instruments. So I'm going to have them in one group. Uh, there is a tambourine and a shaker track. These I would like to ideally have right after my drums. So I'm going to drag my percussions up there. So that's uh, that's our drums, percussion, bass, and the guitar tracks. We are going to there are some DI tracks that you can see. Now, certain bands have a habit of recording uh, a clean DI parallel signal so that in case they wish to reamp and change the tone at a later stage, then the producers or the mix engineer has the ability to do that. But um, I don't intend to change the tones. I pretty much would like to commit to the tones that was given to me by the band. So I'm going to mute those tracks. We're going to pull in our left track first. This seems to be... I'm assuming this, they mean bridge guitar. That's what it means, I guess. And uh, we are going to drag the right track. And the right track also seems to have a DI. So we're going to mute that channel, pull it right under this. And uh, there's a left or lead guitar, octave. And there's another lead guitar here, 57 and, or no, 59. I don't know what these numbers mean, actually. I don't know why they've put those numbers, but we're going to stick to it. Okay, there are more guitar tracks. There's another DI track here. Mute it. There's one more DI track here. Mute it. And we're going to drag these guitar tracks above and drop it there. So what I do when it comes to guitar tracks is I look for regions which have the most activity in them. For example, if you take this guitar track here. It seems it's a stereo track and they've collapsed it uh, into stereo, basically two mono tracks. And they seem to have like the most stuff happening. It starts right from the beginning of the song. It seems to be like the, the rhythm guitar of the song. And there seems to be an additional layer that's kind of filling in these gaps and it continues for the rest of this. So I'm going to keep these three tracks as my first main rhythm guitar tracks. And then these four DI tracks, what do I do with this? I hide and make them inactive because I don't want to use them. So I don't want to ideally see them in the session and get distracted by it. Uh, then comes these verse octaves and stuff like that. We could add that. There is an octave layer. Could be a couple of different layers for what's happening in the track. Okay, we could perhaps move these down, move these up. Yeah, I think that could be fine. Then there's a bridge guitar, then there's the organ, the piano, the roads. When it comes to vocals, yeah, we see that they recorded the lead vocals in two different tracks. You see that there's gaps here, but those gaps are being filled on the other track. So both of them seem to be the lead vocal. I'm going to take the track with the maximum activity and push it on top and then put the other one here, then drag these main harmonies because that seems to be going throughout the track 
and then there is these other background vocals okay let's put the low first the high after that and the other high one then there's a small ad lib towards the end okay so looks like our session is kind of organized and we know what's happening where so this is the order in which i like my tracks to be because when i mix them i mix them in this order this is going to be more or less my priority of mixing this is how i'm going to start tackling through each and every track the other thing that usually or generally bothers me is when i'm mixing i'm flipping most of the time i'm on my mix page right and 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 most of you all are too the thing is when i look at these track names they can become very distracting i don't quite know what is what and what is where and this is uh something that i believe can really get in the way and you're going to start searching for your tracks when you need them so i'm going to quickly rename everything and uh to names that i'm used to typically and remove things that are not necessary there snare top snare bottom hi hats tom sorry tom 1 tom 2 overheads then we're going to keep the room track just remove these additional digits or these numbers that's mentioned shaker then there's a tambourine it's a bass di track then there is a bass rat distorted track uh we're just going to call these as guitar 1 the stereo track then i'm going to call these as guitar 2 left the one that's going to be pan left and guitar 2 right now how do i know that these are uh double tracked layers if you look at the region of your tracks you see you can make out the regions are so well aligned that they have to be double tracked instruments so i'm going by the assumption and as you do this more often you'll start kind of seeing waveforms and pretty much you'll be able to eyeball and say what's happening where and the next one we're going to call guitar 3 this can be guitar 4 this can be guitar 5 they all seem to be some kind of a layer or a riff so i'm just naming them as 4 and 5 and so and uh this is going to be guitar 6 if that's okay yeah that's cool and uh organ we're going to pretty much retain just remove that digit there same thing with the the piano track and the roads then we're going to go for lead vocal 1 we're going to go for lead vocal 2 and then we're going to call this backing vocal 1 backing vocal 2 perfect i think that sorts it so we pretty much know now when you go to your mixer section you see the tracks are so clean you can look at the labels and you pretty much know what you're going for uh nothing is kind of lost in this within this tiny little space you can see the entire name so it kind of makes it easier for me to remember what i am tending to the next thing that i do soon after this as i select all my drum tracks and i start grouping them because i want i like creating edit groups so that if i'm moving the volume faders up and down or if i'm trying to cut something then it's applying that to all the regions within those group so um This one's going to be a drum group. I've included my shaker and tambourine because there's not much happening in percussion, so I didn't want to create a separate group just for that. Then there is our bass group. Then we have guitars happening, and then we have organ, piano, and roads. Now I like to club these together. Maybe just call them keys, and our uh, vocals can all be together again. The next thing that I do right after that is I create my buses. Now this is where some producers or engineers use uh, templates. They open 
uh, like basically they import a template which has, you know, you could go in there and you could bring in like a session data or something like that and, and just, you know, and, and start pulling in stuff that you, that are your go-to tracks, go-to aux and bus sends with those plugins loaded in it. I generally like to do it manually because every session is different. It has different kinds of tracks in it, different instruments in it. So I'd like to set things up manually before every session. Uh, so let's add about, I don't know, maybe about 12 aux tracks just to start with and we can add or remove if it becomes too less or too much. The first aux is gonna be my drum bus. The second one is gonna be my parallel compression drums. And usually I call these NYC or I just call it crush NYC because parallel compression technique was kind of initially known as the New York style compression. So either NYC drums or just crush. And then I have a bass bus and then we have a guitar bus. So what happens on these bus tracks is that we send all the individual tracks, we route them out into these buses. So when you move one fader, it controls the volume of the whole group of instruments there. Um, and then we've got lead vocal bus. I wanna have my lead vocal separately. Since there are two separate tracks, I can process them by adding plugins here instead of adding them onto my lead vocal channels and having two instances of each plugin. I could do that on the bus directly. Backing vocal bus, and then I like to have my verb, that's my reverb. Uh, and then I would like to set up a delay sometimes. And uh, one verb and delay is kind of good. I think it's, it's a fairly straight punk rock track. And then I would like to have my rare bus. Then I would like to have my um, sub mix. And this one seems to be an additional unnecessary thing. We're gonna go ahead and delete it. And we're gonna add a master track. And we're gonna call this master in caps. You can see that I have a bit of this OCD that everything needs to be super clean. I'm sure by now you've figured this out. But yeah, it helps me. When visually things look good and it looks clean and tidy, I believe that it helps my workflow a lot. And so give it a shot, try it out. I really do think it does help your workflow as well. The next thing that I would like to do is start sending these tracks to the respective buses. So select all of the drum tracks, including these percussion and send them to my bus one and two. And these tracks go to bus two, or sorry, bus three and four. They're all stereo groups. And this one goes to the next one, that's five and six. And my organ keys, all of these goes into the seven and eight. My lead vocals would go into nine and 10. My backing vocals would go into 11 and 12 and we have to set those inputs here so that the output of those tracks are going into the input of these tracks. That's that's kind of what we're trying to do. And uh, we set them up. Now, when you start mixing, ideally, it's harder to figure out where these tracks are, which bus is what. The chances are you'll possibly forget it. So it's a good habit. Once you do this routing, go and name all of these tracks. It really, really helps when you name everything. So what we're gonna do here is um, go to bus one and two, rename this as drum bus. I'm gonna do this for all the tracks. I'm gonna call this crush and then I'm gonna call this bass bus. Then this is gonna be tar bus. Some of these features might be slightly different on your logic compared to uh, or, or or whichever DAW that you're using. They could be like very, very slightly different, not much. But again, like I said, um, the functions are gonna be very similar. You're gonna be able to do all of these things irrespective of which DAW you're using. The way you do it might be a bit different and you might just need to 
Google and find a workaround of how you do it on your DAW. But remember, these things remain the same. The concept remains the same. That's it. And this goes to master. Uh, okay, so all of these tracks, our buses are all going into the master track. But what I want to do is I want to send them into my submix track and not into my master track. So I'm going to select all of these buses, send them into my submix and the submix then goes into the master. So before the master track, if I wish to add any kind of mix bus processing, then I can do it on my submix track. That's generally what I do. Um, technically speaking, now our audio files should be playing should be routed well and we should be able to hear all the instruments so let's give this a listen It's working great. Everything's coming through. I can hear the drums, I can hear the guitars, the bass, the organ stuff, the pianos and, and the vocals and stuff like that. It's great. Now, the next thing that I, I start doing once I'm done with this is I'd like to label or put markers on top so it's easier for me to go through different sections of the song. And for this, I really need to know the song first. Okay. So what I do is as I toggle and play the tracks, I start putting my markers down here. That's what I, I generally do with it. So the song starts on bar number three. So we're going to put a marker there and I'm going to call it my intro. Okay, around bar 12 seems to be where my vocal starts or my first verse starts uh, in a sense. So but well, let's open a new marker. We're going to call this verse one. I'm just going to press V1. That kind of sounds like the chorus for me, so I think it's there. I'm not sorry. No, it's correct over there. And this little drop here, you could maybe call it a pre-chorus, but or, or you could just leave it. Yeah, so I think I'm just gonna call it pre-chorus. Okay, uh, let's move on. This is like this motif that kind of comes back. It sounds like it's the same thing that happened in the intro, the same lines kind of coming back. So I'm just going to call it interlude. Looks like it ends where the shaker ends. Great. We're going to call that verse two.
Okay, I think I think I would like to rename this. I would like to call this bridge instead of drop down. It's a long bridge and then I take it back to take it back. Oh, oh. Yeah, that's pretty much the track. Uh, kind of like predictable structure, right? I mean, like if you've heard uh, many other rock songs before, punk rock songs before, like Green Day or whatever, you you kind of start thinking, I think that's what's happening. That's what's coming next. So, but it's still a really nice, sweet track. I quite like the energy uh, in the performance, and I and I, I like how um, all of it is kind of coming together in a way. Uh, but now, okay, so this helps me. The reason why I did this is because when I'm mixing a track, if I just want to quickly go back to the intro, go back to the verse or a chorus or something like that, I can have this memory location page open here and keep it somewhere in a corner of my screen. Then I can keep clicking and you see my playhead will move to wherever I'm clicking and it'll play the track from there. So it's a really useful feature to have, uh, especially when you're mixing uh songs that are a little more complicated with many different kinds of sections you want to keep going back and forth and stuff like that so that helps uh, the next step after i do this would be start creating some kind of a static balance now before i create static balance i usually tend to do something called a gain stage thing now this is something that actually i could talk about in detail in a different video because there is a lot of um, myth and a lot of uh, conflicting uh, thoughts and views about gain staging, especially in the digital realm. Uh, so uh, I, we could maybe talk about it in a different video. But for now, what I want to start doing is, I know that none of my individual tracks are clipping, so that's good. Everything's been recorded at a fairly conservative, good level. Not too low, not too high, but the cumulative level is kind of making my master track or the master channel a clip but that's okay we can always control that we can either even load a trim plugin on that channel and pull it down and you're not going to be affecting any of the tonality of any of the tracks that's perfectly fine so the first thing i'm going to do is start if something is too loud uh, i'm going to pull the fader down and i'm going to try and use my pan knobs and get things in in, in a position that i would ideally like them to be so, so i'm going to first uh, solo my drum tracks so that's the thing, right? When I created these groups here that you saw on the left, what it allows me to do is I can quickly solo all my drum tracks. I can mute all my drum tracks. And if I make any cuts by moving around here, it's going to select all of my drum tracks at once and make cuts together. That's the advantage of it. So for now, I'm going to solo it and I'm going to just start setting my levels up. Oops, hang on. Uh, one simple thing I forgot. I need to, when I solo those tracks, I need to make sure that these buses are solo too. So I'm going to commit on these solos here so that I have to keep, I don't have to keep going back and switching them. Let's do it again. Uh, right off the bat, the shakers are too loud. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull the shakers down. So you see the hats are kind of really loud when it starts off, then it gets really quiet. And in this chorus section, it's kind of like belting out again. So I'm not able to find like an in-between level. So I'm going to kind of keep it here, but we may either have to select individual regions and clip gain them, or I may use automation or control them with compression later. Uh, the next thing I want to do is look at these room and hall tracks. I'm going to pull them down completely.
You see how the drums are so lifeless right now? Because without the room tracks, without the, the natural reflections within a room, your instruments tend to sound really artificial in that sense. So which is why it's important, even when you're recording in a, in a, in a room, it's necessary that you have some kind of reflection, some kind of healthy reflections happening within the room. It's necessary to have that little bit of a live room. I always prefer a live room compared to a dead room, completely paneled up, that there's absolutely no wall surface, no rebounds happening at all. I hate such things. Let's bring the room track up and you'll see what you're missing. There you go, see that? Lifeless. Because that's how you hear the drums when you're hearing it in a room played by a drummer. You hear the, the sound of the drums hitting the walls, reflections, all of that coming at you at once. And, and it's, it's necessary that we try and retain that naturalness as much as we can. Uh, okay, the drum seems to be kind of more or less balanced for me. Another thing that I do, especially with, I realized in this track, the toms aren't playing much. There's only a couple of sections where the toms are actually doing a fill. If not those regions, there's nothing much happening. So here's what I would like to do. I would like to mute out the areas where the toms are not being used. So that allows me to cut down a ton of unnecessary snare, whatever kind of bleed. I'm going to disengage the group temporarily. Just going to select these two, chop them. Chop, chop and sorry maybe yeah maybe there make another cut make another cut maybe there i'm eyeballing all of these things guys um based on the regions again over time with experience you kind of get to know what it looks like but initially you may have to hear each and every little bit and then take decisions Okay, there's just two places where I'm hearing the toms. That's that's fine. All right. So the next thing I want to do is I like my hi hats panned slightly to the right because I like having listening to the drums from a drummer's perspective. So I'd like my um, I like my tom to be panned out a bit to the side, and and you kind of get like a widespread sound. You can also kind of keep the toms a bit closed in like that if you want. That's perfectly fine too. If you especially go to this fill section, you'll get an idea of how it sounds. Um, there you go. Yeah, that sounds nice. Sounds more natural-like that way. The next thing is the room hall. Okay, the shakers and tambourine, usually um, they can be in the center. It's not like it's bothering me because it's not even playing at the same time. Otherwise, I could have panned them left and right and something like that. But what I can do is uh, I can maybe just nudge them slightly to the side, face slightly like that. Yeah, it just gives it a little bit of a space, you know, clears up the things that are in the center. At the center, ideally, I want my kick, snare, bass, and uh, my vocal. Those are the things that I want in the center at all cost. Uh, even these room tracks and hall tracks, I would have ideally had them stereo, like panned out. But since they're all mono rooms and mono hall, I'm going to just leave them there. And uh, the bass tracks. Okay, so I'm going to first solo just the clean bass. I 
I like the clean bass to be kind of up there. Uh, you notice that some notes were a bit loud. Again, compression all the way. Compression is going to save us there. Uh, let's bring in the distorted bass, pull it down fully, and then slowly fade in and see at what level does it feel nice. This kind of distorted bass actually helps you get your bass to cut through on small speakers such as your phone and laptop speakers. You tend to hear your bass a lot more clearly when you have these distorted one. So it's very helpful to have it actually. So, but again, don't overdo it. Depends on the kind of track. If you're mixing some sort of, some sort of a loud metal song, maybe you want to push the distorted bass a lot higher, but otherwise you, you may want to keep it somewhere there. Again, these are kind of roughly the levels that I think it should be at. I could always automate things during the mix and, and bring them close to where I want them to be. Uh, the next thing is going to be guitars. Let's try one track at a time. Wow. some kind of uh like to pull him down a bit but see what's happening on guitar six i don't hear much activity on that oh it's somewhere oh it's just wow okay it's just pretty much towards the end. hear the fill and see if the toms are
to be like so here's the thing you know when you bring in the guitars you uh you're bound to feel that the drums are kind of like slightly getting drowned out but the reason why i've not pushed the drums yet is because i know i'm going to be using parallel compression which is why this crush bus was created for and the moment i do that i know that my drums are going to start coming through a lot more so as far as i can just about hear it and it it feels okay it's maybe it's a little low but it's fine i would like to leave it there for now because i know that parallel compression is going to kick in and it's going to make things a lot more different and now let's bring in the vocals and see what happens <laughs> like my vocals to be a little more higher maybe i'll just push it up by i don't know db each maybe 2 db i don't think a db would really make much of a difference this time last year we were looking up but we were grasping at straws so believe for the last time this year i'll be at the stop by total strangers at a party So here's the thing uh, I would spend maybe another 15 20 minutes trying to get the static mix kind of like uh you know going uh maybe take a short break come back and just just spend another 15 20 minutes and get this going uh tweak it very little here and there and stuff like that the backing vocals already panned so I'm not touching them if they were mono instances then I would have panned them left and right um the other thing is like I said the gain staging part you know I mean there are some places where it's clipping even at there's some snare hits and some uh you know hits here and there kind of just pushes it to the red uh but i i believe that um it's not so bad here so what i'm going to do is as i start uh adding my plugins and i'm going to take care of some of these transient especially kicks snares these are transient heavy instruments and it can push your drum tracks fairly loud there's going to be a ton of compression that's going in on the drum bus the crush and all of that so it will tame everything and put them in its place and i feel that things are going to be okay and if it's still kind of loud i can like i said i can always throw in a trim plugin on this and bring the overall track volume down like maybe even if i bring it down by maybe let's say 5 db and this is exactly the reason why i have created a sub mix because now what happens is whatever is going through this the mix bus processing and all that that i would may or may not put in is all going to be processed and then the trim applies to the overall signal that's finally uh, being spit out by pro tools so hence having a sub mix really helps otherwise you're going to have to keep moving these plugins down and up and keep doing a lot of that stuff so uh that's pretty much my workflow and how i set up a session to start mixing i hope you uh uh this was really helpful for you and that you enjoyed this i know this was a bit of a long one but i didn't want to cut down i didn't want to hide things and just explain it or give you a gist of it and let you imagine and do things by yourself i wanted to let you in as if you're sitting next to me in the studio and watching me work as i do it so thank you for staying with me through this really really appreciate 
Do let me know if you've enjoyed this video. Do let me know your thoughts and your comments below. I'd be very happy. Uh, do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Invite your friends. Hit the notification bell. Give it a thumbs up if you've enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And I'll see you soon in another video episode. And until then, do not forget to create, play and record.